My name is Patsy Cottrell of the Nashville Bar. Today is May 1, 2019, and I'm in Nashville, Tennessee, to interview Judge Aleda Trauger of the U.S. District Court for the Middle District of Tennessee. This interview is taking place as part of the Legal History Project of the Fellows of the Tennessee Bar Foundation. Good afternoon. Hi, Patsy. Hi, Leda. Please state your full name and your date and place of birth. Aleda May Grillis Arthur Trauger. Um, I was born on December 9th of 1945 in Fitzsimmons Army Hospital in Denver, Colorado. Good. Tell us about your grandparents on both sides. Okay. My Greek grandfather, Greek grandparents on my dad's side, um, my grandfather came over uh, in about 1916 with the big waves of immigrants from Europe, uh, from Crete. Um, he and my grandmother went to, uh, they had had three children in, uh, on Crete, and my father was the first child born in the States. They went directly to Rock Springs, Wyoming, uh, because there was a Greek community there, um, and uh, they were coal miners. And so my grandfather mined coal for the Union Pacific Railroad. They lived in a um, Greek community. My grandparents never learned to speak English, um, but all of the children had nine children, I think. All of the children, um, uh, except for the two older sisters who were married off at 14 to older men, uh, all the rest of them uh, went to college. Um, some of them became lawyers, some became, no, there were no lawyers. There was a college professor and various. And uh, we visited them occasionally, uh, but they, my father um, did not marry a Greek woman. So for many years, they were estranged from his parents. They finally accepted her at some point. Um, but uh, so we did uh, visit there some. Then on my mother's side, um, she, uh, my mother was a second generation native of Denver and her mother was a first generation native of Denver. Her mother was Italian. Um, they came over, her great grandparents came over at the same time as my Greek grandparents. Um, and uh, her grandfather was Swedish. Um, so I'm half Greek, quarter Swedish, and quarter Italian. Um, I know less about the sort of background of that family than I know about the Greek side. Uh, I do know that my grandmother, uh, my grandmother's mother at some point died. And at that time, it was very common for men to not be able to take care of children. And so I know that she and her Two siblings were placed in an orphanage for a period of time until um, uh, the father remarried and then they were taken out of the orphanage. And that was apparently pretty common at that time. Anyway. So tell me about your, your father's name. He was Greek, right? Yes, his name was uh, Murdick or Manuso in Greek, Murdick John Grillos. And your mother's name? And my mother was Betty May Anderson. So that's where you get the May. That's where I get the May, M-A-E. And tell me about your parents, what, what they... Uh, my father was, uh, uh, went to the, you know, well, there's an interesting story about my father in the coal mining. Um, he uh, coal mined every summer when he was in high school and presumed that he would go down in the mine when he graduated from high school. And so he worked in the mine that summer. Uh, it got to be the end of the summer. He came home and his father had packed up his belongings in a uh, cardboard box with twine and set it on the front porch and said, you're going off to the University of Wyoming instead of going into the mine. And so he went off to the University of Wyoming and uh, did three years there um, and then uh, joined what he called the old army before the draft in World War II. Uh, and then he ended up never finishing college. 
um, was kind of an unsuccessful real estate agent, uh, collection agent. Uh, my mother really was the breadwinner in our family. Um, my mother uh, met my father at the University of Wyoming. She was getting a two-year secretarial degree. She was a couple years younger than my dad. And uh, they married um, during the war. My two older brothers were born out in Seattle. And then uh, they moved to Denver after the war. And uh, my mom, uh, my earliest memory uh, of my mom uh, working was as an Avon lady. Um, and she took me door to door when I was two or three while she was an Avon lady. And then by the time I started school, she uh, went to work as a legal secretary. So she was a legal secretary uh, my whole life. And uh, uh, she was a legal secretary into her 80s, actually. Um, and she was the breadwinner because she had a solid salary coming in every month. And she obviously worked hard. She worked very hard, but she cooked every single night. Uh, on Sundays, she cooked much of the day, making homemade pie or cake or something. Um, she was very interested in the arts. She uh, went to the symphony. My father was not interested in arts, so she either went with her friends or went by herself, but she was very active in the symphony. Uh, plays, she took me to plays. She took me to uh, the big movies that came out, Sound of Music, My Fair Lady, all those. West Side Stories and all that. Um, uh, she was very interested in the arts. She uh, she did a lot of crafts at night. She would sit on the couch and do crafts. Um, she learned Greek. Uh, she learned Greek cooking from my grandmother. Uh, she was a great cook and she cooked a lot. Um, did, people would ask whether your mother's work as a legal secretary somehow influenced your your interest in the law? It really didn't. I never thought about being a lawyer. Uh, and even when I was a kid, we had two cousins that were at the University of Denver Law School that lived near us. And every Sunday night, they brought over a half gallon of chocolate ice cream and, <laughs> and watched TV with us. And they were a big part of my life growing up. They were my favorite cousins and I adored them, but I still never thought about going to law school until much, much later. Did you ever learn Greek? I took one year of classical Greek in college, um, and I don't know if you want to talk about my desire to be a classics professor, but that's okay. that's what I always wanted to do. I took Latin, and I took one year of Greek. I never learned conversational modern Greek. Never did. Did, did you learn Greek cooking? Yes, I learned Greek cooking from my mom. Yep, I did. Okay, so I'm going to ask you sort of about your childhood, and you grew up in Denver. I grew up in Denver uh, until I was 10. Uh, we lived in the inner city. We lived very close to downtown Denver. My, my public elementary school was half African American, a quarter Hispanic, and a quarter white. And um, uh, I was there until the middle of fourth grade. Uh, the school was right across from, we lived right across from the school, and my mother lived just, my mother worked two blocks from our home, uh, and so she would walk to work. Uh, then when I was 10, we moved to the suburbs in Denver, uh, but I went to uh, public schools the whole way through school, never thought about doing anything else. Most people in Denver really didn't, unless you were, uh, perhaps went to parochial schools, but other private schools, there were hardly any, and it was mostly people with discipline problems went to private schools <laughs> unless you were broke in school. So while you were in high school, did you work? Yes, I started working as soon as I could uh, for uh, one of my mother's clients, uh, her office's clients, they did a lot of collection work and they did collection work for Rose Memorial Hospital in Denver. And so, um, uh, my mother got me a job working in the business office of that hospital uh, from the time I was 15 or 16. So uh, every summer of high school, every summer of college, I worked in the business office of the hospital. Okay. While you were in high school, did you were there any influential teachers or particular courses that really grabbed your attention and interest? I had some great English teachers. Um, 
I enjoyed Latin. I took four years of Latin. Um, I was uh, president of the Junior Classical League, uh, the club that Latin kids or Latin students are in. Um, I took four years of clothing. Um, I learned to make my own patterns and uh, uh, made did a lot of sewing. I don't even do my own hands now, but anyway, I did a lot of sewing in much of my life. Um, but uh, I took a lot of AP courses. I had an incredible math teacher my junior year uh, that taught us so much theory that when I took uh, the SAT, I got a higher score in math than in English, which is kind of unusual. Uh, but he just was a fabulous math teacher. Um, uh, I had a lot of really excellent teachers. The, the high school was a, a relatively new high school. We were, I think, the second class to go all the way through that school. And high school at that time in Denver was 10th, 11th, and 12th. And then junior high was 7th, 8th, and 9th. And uh, that school was in, it was located, we, we were in a sort of middle class area where we lived, but it was located in a pretty uh, high class area of Denver. And uh, that's, the, the people in that area managed to hire away from a lot of schools in Denver, the best teachers. I mean, we had incredible teachers at that school. So you mentioned you took Latin for four years and you were in the Classics Club, is that what you said? Yeah, it's the Junior Classical League. It's Junior called. Classic League. And um, so that's, did you develop an interest in the classics? Yes. Um, I wanted to be a classics professor. Uh, I picked my college because it was uh, a small liberal arts college that had a major in classics. Um, and it offered me enough money to be able to go to college because my parents could not afford to send me to college. Did you always know you wanted to go to college? Oh, yes. There was never any question about that. Never any question about that. And the factors that you weighed in your choice of college were, as you said, the classics program? Well, yes, but I, I didn't really, uh, uh, we didn't have money for me to travel and look at colleges like kids do these days. Um, lots of colleges recruited at my very large public high school in Denver. And so Cornell College in Iowa was one of the first colleges to come in the early fall to, Cornet, to uh, uh, my high school. And um, they had a, uh, a major in classics, which was important to me. Having gone to such an enormous public high school, I wanted to go to a smaller college. So Cornell at that time was 1,000, 1,100, something like that. So I met the uh, admissions fellow. Uh, he was very interested in me. Uh, said that they would give me uh, enough grants and loans, and then, of course, I would have board jobs. I would have to work all the way through college, but that I would be able to go there. And he came to my house and convinced my very old-fashioned Greek father that they would take care of me and make sure I didn't get in trouble. Um, and as I say, they gave me enough money. So I applied for early admission. Uh, I got early admission, got enough aid, and I never applied anywhere else but I had never seen Cornell when I showed up in the fall to go there. It was sight unseen in the middle of the cornfields of Iowa. <laughs> um, how did you finance your college education? You've told us then how you financed it, but you worked. Tell us what kind of jobs yeah, you Yeah, I worked had. every summer at the hospital. And then I had various board jobs. Um, I was a secretary for a lot of departments. Um, uh, I, I spent a year in a semester in England, and for that, for me to be able to do that, I had to have three board jobs the summer before I went, and three board jobs, I mean the semester before I went, and three board jobs the, the semester when I got back. A board job was basically about eight hours of work a week, and so I worked the, um, I worked the, uh, I can't think of the word, the phone system in the dorm, the, the whatever you call the phone system. Anyway, I worked at the front desk at my dorm. I was a secretary for various departments. Um, I set up the music in the music room. Uh, I delivered campus mail. Uh, one semester, I had to work in the uh, food service, and I, and I had to uh, scoop ice cream, and that was my least favorite job. I hated that job. 
Uh, <laughs> but the rest of them were fine. Why did you hate scooping ice cream? Because my knuckles got all torn up and bloody and the blood went in the ice cream and that's why. <laughs> Good reason. It's hard to scoop ice cream. And what was your major? My major, well, my major uh, was, of course, when I started out, classics. And I took my uh, first year of classical Greek. I loved it. There were three of us in the class. We all got A's. At the end of my first year, my freshman year, my classics professor said, you're not going to major in classics, are you? And I said, well, yes. I picked Cornell because you had a classics major. And he asked me what I wanted to do. And I said, I want to be a classics professor. Now, remember, this is the spring of 1965. And he said, um, well, you know, there are very few jobs and they'll always hire a man before they'll hire a woman, which was true at that time. And so I promptly changed my major, dropped my lifelong desire to be a, a classics professor. Uh, first, I switched to French uh, briefly, uh, and then I switched to English. My uh, English professor my freshman year was a big mentor to me, and she thought I'd be a really good English major, and so I ended up majoring in English. So you got your degree um, from Cornell College in what year? 68. In English? Yes. During that time, the time you were in college and a little after it, there were great changes and going on in the country, a lot led by young people. Did any of that impact you or your college experience? Did it sort of make it to Cornell College? In it Iowa? definitely made it to Cornell College. Um, in fact, my first husband, who was the president of our senior class, uh, had as his class picture uh, in the Cornell Annual, a picture of Ho Chi Minh, uh, as opposed to himself. <laughs> and he, in fact, led a takeover of the administration building at uh, Cornell College my senior year. Um, he was involved uh, at Vanderbilt, where he did his graduate work, uh, washing flags and people getting arrested and and conspiring with uh, very radical groups to do things. So yes, it made it to Cornell College. It didn't make it too much to me. I was uh, pretty uh, ignorant, I would say, and very apolitical. My, I grew up, my parents were Republicans, like most people in Colorado at that time. Um, I was not active politically. Uh, I was not very tuned in to current events at all growing up. My family just didn't, didn't talk about current events um, around the dinner table uh, or what was in the newspaper. I, I grew up very ignorant, really, about current events and politics. Um, I don't believe I participated in any demonstrations at Cornell. There weren't too many right at Cornell. There were many more uh, down the road at um, the University of Iowa. It was much more political activity at the University of Iowa. Um, and a lot of Cornell students went down the road and participated in those. But I, I, really, I really didn't. I didn't feel that I knew enough about what was going on to really participate. So I didn't. So you graduated from college. And what was your sort of career expectation, or what were your plans at that point? Well, you know, in 1968, there were really kind of three careers for women. It was secretary or teacher or nurse, uh, uh, for the most part. Uh, and most of us that graduated in English uh, from Cornell College uh, ended up being teachers. That's basically what you did. Or some people went into publishing. They were lucky enough to get jobs with Britannica or Compton's or something in Chicago. And Chicago was a big mecca for kids from Iowa to go to after they graduate. So I uh, started right after I graduated from Cornell, I started a Master of Arts in Teaching at Northwestern University in Chicago. And um, <clears throat> it was a very intense program. You had to take graduate level courses in your major, which was English. Uh, and then do student teaching. And then at night, you had to figure out if you were going to prepare for your graduate level courses or your student teaching. I was pretty burned out. I'd worked very hard on a uh, master's thesis, uh, on a honors thesis, 
uh, my senior year and I was pretty burned out and I ended up dropping out of that program after a couple months. Um, and so I went to work for an ad agency. You're still um, in Chicago at this point. I'm still in Chicago. I decided to stay in Chicago. Uh, I got a job. It was like Mad Men. It was um, a large, uh, it's called Needham, Harper & Steers, one of the big ad agencies on Michigan Avenue in Chicago. I was a secretary in the creative division. So I worked with the writers and the, writers and the artists, and it was so fun. They were just wonderful people. I had such a great time. But after, I don't know how many months, four or five months, I started feeling guilty that I wasn't in school. And what was I going to do with this English degree? So I found out that if I was a secretary uh, at Northwestern, I could take free graduate level courses. So I took a job as a secretary in the physics department at Northwestern uh, and started taking classes in French. Um, and I did that for a while, maybe three or four months. Uh, and then I found out uh, that at that time, you know, men were starting to go into the army and uh, they needed social workers in Chicago. And they were hiring social workers with a degree in anything, a bachelor's degree in anything, even English. And it paid a whole lot better than what I was making. And so I decided I would do that. I think I had a couple friends who were doing it too. So I did that and I was a social worker um, in West Chicago in a Hispanic neighborhood for several months. Um, I found it very frustrating. I didn't feel like I was doing any good for anybody. And so uh, at the end of that school year, basically, the beginning of that summer, I went back to Denver and uh, worked as a secretary all summer and applied, reapplied for Master of Arts in Teaching degrees at several places around the country. Uh, so so there was, was gonna, a time there where you were really trying to figure out what you, what I you thought really you might I was really trying to, do. that's right. I, I really was trying to figure out, it was a very, very unstable year for me. Very, very unstable year. And I think as we go through this interview, I think there are gonna be times where I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about things that may be somewhat unique to you among the interviewees that have gone before because you were a young woman who was going through whatever was in the country at the time, like you said, that, that your advisor told you that people would hire a man before a woman, and, and later as a lawyer. So you're sort of being undecided. Was that at all affected by what you thought the opportunities might be for you because you were a woman? Well, I, um, I mean, I always knew I could be a secretary. <laughs> um, and really, uh, at that time, the only thing that really occurred to me was to be a teacher with an English degree. Um, I was, I did have friends in Chicago who uh, had landed jobs with publishers. Uh, uh, I had uh, one friend who became uh, an airline stewardess for Air France. She'd majored in French. Um, um, but really, most of my friends had become teachers or were becoming teachers. Okay. So that summer you were applying for uh, graduate school? Yeah, to get uh, a Master of Arts in Teaching. Um, so I, that summer I did that and <clears throat> I ended up uh, dating someone, uh, the one that had his picture as Ho Chi Minh. Uh, we had dated a little at Cornell College and he was from Denver and we were both back in Denver that summer. He had started graduate school at Vanderbilt uh, to get his PhD in philosophy. And so he was home for the summer. We're both home for the summer. We started dating um, and it got to be toward the end of the summer. And he invited me to come and live with him in Nashville. And I hadn't applied to any schools in Nashville, but he said, well, come down here. You can apply to Vanderbilt, see if you can get your MAT there. And, and I knew that my very old fashioned Greek father would disown me if I uh, came and lived with him here. And so he said, well, then let's get married. So. I was very unstable that year and I thought, okay, let's get married. So we planned a wedding in two, two, two weeks. Uh, we got married at, in August of 1969. Um, my whole family, I'm sure, thought I was pregnant. I was not <laughs> um, when you plan a wedding for two weeks. But at any rate, uh, I moved back to Nashville with him. That's what brought me to Nashville. He had started graduate school at Vanderbilt uh, and I uh, 
typically my secretarial skills. I My first job in Nashville was in Alexander Hurd's office, the chancellor at Vanderbilt. I was a secretary uh, in his office. Um, and then I started taking, uh, I got into the MAT program and I started doing coursework uh, for my MAT. And so we were in Nashville for a year and then um, John Arthur, my husband, uh, decided that he wanted to uh, study at the university uh, at uh, London School of Economics for a year. So we uh, went that summer, that first summer, we spent, uh, he was in the British University Summer School in Edinburgh, Scotland. So we were in Edinburgh, Scotland for the summer. And he was in a program and I was writing to every school I could find in London trying to get a teaching job uh, without success. Uh, so we came to London. We had a spot in an international student's house in London, uh, and he was going to clean toilets. And uh, if I could get a job, we could stay there. If I could not get a job, we didn't have enough money to stay there for the year. So we moved into the international student's house, and I got on the phone and started calling every school that I could find uh, in the phone book. And I happened to call a little boy's prep school in Surrey. Uh, and the headmaster said that uh, we had a master who did not show up. And if you can come and teach everything that he was going to teach, we started yesterday. If you can come and teach everything he was going to teach, uh, I will hire you. And I said, well, what's that? And it was all the English history in the school. I'd never had English history. Uh, French, I'd had two years of French. Uh, geography, uh, we don't teach geography in American schools much. English, we do that. Uh, and soccer to the eight-year-olds. This was 1969. We didn't play soccer in the United States in 1969. And I said, sure, I can do all of that. <laughs> and he hired me. And so I taught there for a semester. It was a school right out of Victorian England. Uh, we started every morning with the Victorian moral tale. Um, if the headmaster came by my class and the little boys were misbehaving, he would come in and tell them that a little devil was sitting on their shoulder, uh, whispering in their ear to be mean to the uh, nice American teacher. Uh, it was quite an experience. Um, and it was a two and a half hour commute each way from where we lived. So I had to take the tube, the subway, and then get on a British rail train. I had to stay late on Wednesday night. Uh, I would get home about 10 o'clock. And then we had half days on Saturdays. So it was grueling, grueling work. Um, and it was not counting for my internship teaching at Vanderbilt because it was not a state-supported school. So I was also trying to find a job in London that would be closer that would count toward my internship teaching. So I landed finally a job uh, in Dagenham, which is East London. If you've seen To Sir With Love or if you've watched Call the Midwife, it was that area. Uh, it was the docks, it was the Ford plant. Uh, it was a very tough area. It was all the way across London for me. It was an hour commute on the subway. Um, and it was a newly formed comprehensive school. And I taught uh, uh, I was teaching at the right level, at least. I wasn't teaching little boys uh, under 12. I was teaching high school students, basically. And I was teaching mostly English, a little bit of math. Um, but it was a tough school. There was a lot of corporal punishment. Uh, I was not raised with corporal punishment. Denver schools didn't have corporal punishment when I was growing up. Uh, and I really refused to paddle the children. And so... It's good I was only there about a, about a semester because uh, they were catching on that I was never going to paddle anybody. And it was, <laughs> discipline was getting to be a real challenge. But uh, did you have any, any, did you have any problems or how did the students and the faculty react to an American? Well, I wasn't Especially the only foreigner. English. <laughs> well, we, <laughs> I wasn't the only foreigner. One of my best friends there was from Australia, and they're very adventuresome, and she was a wonderful gal, and I loved being with her. Uh, but we were at a disadvantage because um, instead of the students moving room to room, which is typically the platoon system in school, the teachers moved from room to room. 
So you would come into the room and the kids were already there, typically acting up. And I'll never forget, there was one boy, he was a 10th grader, and he liked to imitate, imitate James Cagney when he was around me uh, for the American teacher. And he was also just really, he acted out all the time. And uh, one time I came in and he appeared to almost be uh, having uh, sexual intercourse with another little girl on a desk. And he stood up on the desk and asked me if I wanted to see his, uh, his shorts. And I said, no, but he dropped his trousers and we all saw his boxer shorts with polka dots on them. And, uh, took him by the nape of the neck to the headmaster's office. Um, and another time, I was uh, uh, he was in my math class, and I was uh, circulating around the room. And I have to say, this was the year of the mini skirt and the maxi coat. And why, as a teacher, I wore mini skirts, I don't know, but it's just what everybody wore in 1969 and 70. So I wore a mini skirt. I was um, helping a little. Uh, uh, helping a child with math, and I was pinched on, you know where I was pinched. And I whirled around, and that little boy was right there, and I was convinced he was the one who had pinched me. And I didn't even think about it, I just smacked him, smack in the face. Um, probably would be arrested these days to do that. But anyway, I found out a couple of days later it wasn't him, but you know, that's that was that experience. But um, it was a very interesting experience. It did count as my internship teaching. So when we came back uh, at the end of that year, um, I just had one more semester of coursework, which I was able to finish up while I was also teaching in Tennessee. So you were one more semester of coursework at Vanderbilt for yeah. your master's. Yeah. Okay. And, and I then you taught much, in Tennessee. Yeah, I taught my first job. Well, we got back you know, the English schools go later in the summer than American schools. And so we didn't, I don't think we got back here until like July. And I could not get a job in Metro. The only job I could get was at Greenbrier Junior High in Robertson County, uh, teaching current events. Uh, I taught all the boys, this was seventh and eighth grade. I taught all the boys one day when the girls were in gym and all the girls the next day when the, when the boys were in gym. It was wonderful because I had one preparation every two days. So if you've ever taught, that's, you know, that's a dream thing. And by about the third period, you're on automatic pilot. You don't even know what you're saying. Uh, but anyway, I did that for a semester. And then uh, I got a job at Franklin High School, finally doing what I was really supposed to do, and that's to teach high school English. And I had the AP kids, and they were really smart, and it was fun, and um so that was the last year and a half of my teaching. And so at some point you decided that perhaps teaching was not the best thing you could do for you. Being an English teacher was not the best thing for me. To me, English teachers were quirky and they'd read everything that ever been written and they were characters, and those were my favorite English teachers, and that was not me. Uh, and I knew I would never be that kind of an English teacher. I think I was a good teacher. Uh, a lot of my students thought I was a good teacher, and I've seen a lot of them since because I've stayed in the area, and so I've seen some of them. Um, but uh, I didn't think I'd ever be a great English teacher. Um, my experience in Tennessee was that the principals were mostly coaches, and at Franklin High School, I was graded down because I was not standing at the front of the class lecturing from a lectern. I had the students in a circle and we were talking about literature and I was graded down for that. So um, I started thinking about doing something else. And uh, after I'd been there a year and a half, and it, so this was my third year of teaching, uh, my husband finished his PhD in philosophy. So he was ready to become a philosophy professor. So he was ready to bring home the bacon. I had been bringing home the bacon. And so I started thinking about what I would do, and I decided that I was going to go back to my original goal and become a classics professor. So would you like to hear why I didn't end up doing that? Well, yes. Let's, let's <laughs> hear why you, what you did when you decided that you wanted to be a classics professor, that you, that you wanted to try again, something you'd always wanted to do. 
Um, and what I, was the first thing you thought you would do? Well, I had heard that there was a classics professor, a woman classics professor at Vanderbilt. And so I made a cold call to Susan Wiltshire, who has since become a very good friend of mine. But I made a cold call to Susan Wiltshire. And uh, I told her, you know, what I want to do. And she said, now, tell me again, your husband is going to be a philosophy professor and you want to be a classics professor. She said, do you ever want to be even ever in the same state, let alone the same city? She said, you will never get jobs in the same place. And she was right. And so those hopes were dashed again. So I didn't do that. So I started okay. casting about, trying to figure so, out what I was going to do. And did you, uh, eventually, apparently, you came up with the law as a career. And tell us how you got interested in pursuing a okay. legal career. Kind of a couple different things happened. Um, there were some labor issues in the Williamson County Schools. Uh, my last year of teaching, and I went to some of the school board meetings, and um, there was a woman lawyer there at some point. I never ran into her after that. I couldn't tell you her name. But I thought, wow, here's a woman lawyer doing this. And, and I thought, gee, maybe I could be a lawyer and I could, may, I could specialize in representing teachers. That would be pretty cool to do. Um, and about the same time, uh, uh, a couple that we socialized with, the, the, woman was getting, the woman was getting her PhD in philosophy and the man was getting, her husband was getting his degree from Vanderbilt Law School. We were out to dinner with him one night talking about all these things. And, and he just looked at me and said, I think you'd be a really good lawyer. You ought to think about that. You ought to go to law school. And so I hadn't come up with anything better. And those two things kind of came together. And so, uh, so I decided I would try that, having no idea whether I would be able to get into law school, whether I would like law school, whether I would like being a lawyer. I just thought, well, I'll try it. So I took the LSAT. I did better than I thought I would do. And so uh, uh, my husband was applying for philosophy teaching jobs, and I was applying for law schools. And we almost had matchups in a couple of other parts of the country, but we ended up having a matchup back here because I got into Vanderbilt Law School, and he started teaching at the University of Tennessee at Nashville before the merger of UT Nashville and TSU. So he was teaching, and I started. Uh, I started at Vanderbilt. Okay, we're gonna. Uh, I think it's a good time to take a break, and then we'll get into law school and legal career and all those things. Okay, that's okay. Very good. So when we stopped right before break, we were discussing your decision to go to law school. Can you tell us about that? Well, it was really, um, uh, I was just going to go and see what came of it. I had no idea if I was smart enough to go to law school, if I would like it, um, if there was a career for me in it. I just, for lack of anything better to do, that's what I decided to do was to start law school. Okay. Um, so I did. And as a matter of fact, I didn't like law school. Uh, <laughs> First semester was very difficult. Adjusting from reading novels and poetry to reading cases was a huge adjustment. Um, uh, and I think if I had not started clerking after my first year, I'm not sure I would have stayed in law school. Uh, at that time, so this was the summer of 74. At that time, there were three of us in our 170 person class at Vanderbilt that wanted to work that summer. At that time, people played their summer after first year and they clerked their summer after second year. But um, uh, John Kitch and Matt Sweeney and I, uh, we were part of the geriatric group, we called ourselves because we hadn't gone directly from uh, undergraduate school to law school. And there were several of us in our class. We wanted to clerk. And so we all interviewed for the same jobs and everything. I ended up um, being hired by Barrett, Brent and Barrett to work that summer. It was George Barrett. Lionel Barrett, Bob Brandt, uh, Jim Niffen, and Charlie Ray. Uh, and uh, it couldn't have been a more wonderful experience for me. They took me everywhere. Lionel took me to the jail. He was a criminal lawyer. Uh, 
uh, they took me to, Bob took me to depositions. Uh, they sent me to every courthouse. They sent me on all kinds of errands. Um, and I just loved it. And I was able to see what practicing law in Nashville looked like. And I developed the confidence that I could do this. I don't think I can go to Wall Street, but I don't want to go to Wall Street. Um, I want to stay here and I think I can do this. So it gave me confidence and uh, a great interest in practicing uh, in practicing in Nashville. Um, in uh, how many women were in your class? Well, when I entered in the fall of 73, uh, my memory is there were three women in the third year class, 16 in the second year class, and 33 in my class. And um, a lot of people have heard this famous story of the bathroom, the bathroom story. <laughs> Uh, because there were, what, 60 of us or so, and there was one, one whole bathroom uh, in Vanderbilt Law School for women. And it was very inconveniently located. You hardly could get there between classes, uh, let alone be able to use it because there were too many of us. So we approached the administration and said we needed more restrooms for women. And they said, well, you guys can use the women's staff restroom. Well, that was uh, equally... Uh, uh, inconveniently located in another direction, and it only had two stalls. Uh, and so uh, we finally just got sick of it, and we liberated uh, the most centrally located large restroom at the law school. It was a men's restroom. We just planted a sign on the door that said women, uh, and the men didn't give it up easily for the, about the first week. You might come out of a stall and find a man using the urinal. Uh, but they did eventually give it up, and the administration gave us that restroom. But we really had to, with Sissy Daughtry's help, she was fairy godmother to all of us at that time. She was the only full-time woman professor at Vanderbilt. And uh, uh, we formed the Women Law Students Association that year, and uh, uh, we had the courage to do that, which we needed to do. <laughs> and uh, so tell us about a couple of your favorite professors. Tom McCoy for Con Law. I just adored him. Um, Sissy, of course. Uh, Don Hall for Criminal Law. Uh, they were some of my favorites. Uh, Jim Ely, I had him for property, and they ended up doing my senior writing project uh, for him. Uh, but the, the clerking that summer was, you know, it was a time when there were very few women around town in the courthouse or in law firms. Uh, Marietta, Shipley, uh, you, I don't know if you were here that summer, you probably were not because you were at UT, but, um, but there were very few of us around town, Carol McCoy. Um, and so, so at, at we, your firm, I'm sorry, at yeah, your it, firm, um, had they ever had a woman oh, no. in any role there? No, 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 I just mean, secretaries. any lawyer role, yes. Yeah, just secretaries. Yeah. Okay. Uh, but they were wonderful mentors to me. They were so kind to me and, um, uh, but you know, walking, being in the legal community, uh, that at that time as a woman was just a really unique experience. We all have amazing stories for that time. Um, uh, I'll tell you a few of them if you would like. We would like to. Uh, hear them. I think we need to preserve these stories. Okay. All right. Well, when I interviewed uh, with George Barrett, um, he did ask me if I could type. And I know he did that. I mean, after I got to know him, I know he did that just to kind of taunt me and see how I would react to that. Um, he also, that summer, uh, uh, I was used to getting a tan on my legs and not wearing hose in the summertime growing up in Colorado. And I started coming into the office with a tan on my legs and no hose. And he told me that I was in the South and ladies in the South wore hose. And so I had to start wearing hose to the office. Uh, but probably the most amazing story is that uh, that summer, uh, Bob Grant sent me over to an older lawyer's office to deliver something. And I took it into him and he said, are you Bob Grant's secretary? And I said, no, I'm his law clerk. He grabbed me by the shoulders. He walked me down the hall, stood me in the doorway of one of his partner's offices and said, this is Bob Grant's law clerk. I want me one of these. <laughs> 
<laughs> so, I mean, that was just, you know, we all have these stories. Those of us who started practicing at an early time when there were very few women around. And um, so in law school, did you have a study group? Yes. Uh, my first year, uh, I had a study group of uh, Marnie Huff and Susan McGannon and Mary Jo Middlebrooks from Jackson. And uh, we have remained close friends uh, through the years. We started a book group in the early 80s before book groups were a thing. Uh, we still have a book group going since the early 80s. It's now 10, but it started off as five or six with the four of us. And so we've remained very close. Good. So you graduated from Vanderbilt Law School in? 76. 76. That was a good year for women lawyers, wasn't it? It was a good year. Yes, I met you that year. That's right. And lots of us, when we were studying for the bar together, a lot of us met, and it was, it was a wonderful bonding experience to find that there were other women, you know, that were going to be practicing in Nashville. And as a Vanderbilt grad, did you intend to stay in Nashville at that time when you graduated? Uh, I hoped to. Um, John Arthur was teaching at uh, uh, UT Nashville, but, um, but George Barrett... <laughs> had brought the Geyer case, which was challenging the existence of UT Nashville, uh, alleging that the establishment of UT Nashville uh, uh, perpetuated the dual system of higher education in Tennessee because we already had a state-supported higher education institution in Tennessee, and that was Tennessee State University. So George had brought that case, uh, I believe it was first brought in 68, but what happened is it went to trial uh, before Judge Gray in the federal court in the fall of 1976. Jo George had been involved in that case from the beginning. He brought the case in the beginning. He'd never gotten any fees for it, of course. It was a contingency case. Uh, and so when it was coming up for a multi-week trial in federal court, uh, George decided that brand new baby lawyer who hadn't even yet been sworn in was going to be the firm representative at this trial before Judge Gray. So he took me over, had me specially sworn in before Judge Gray, uh, and I was the representative for the original plaintiffs in that lawsuit before Judge Gray. It was the most heady experience. Um, the lawyers involved were uh, Thomas Wardlaw Steele represented UT. Uh, former district court judge, my colleague Joe Haynes, was from the uh, uh, Attorney General's office. Drew Days from Maine Justice uh, represented uh, the Justice Department in that case. Avon Williams uh, represent, and Richard Dinkins represented a group of plaintiff interveners in the case that thought that our group was not representing them. Um, I actually cross-examined my then-husband's boss, who was the chancellor of UT Nashville. It was an incredible, uh, weird experience to be able to participate in that federal court litigation right out of the box. So you, you didn't really have a big job hunt? You didn't go through the placement office looking for a job because no. you had clerked? Is well, what right? happened is at the end of the f of my first summer of teaching, after my first year of law school, uh, George uh, said, we don't want you to try out for law review. I didn't want to try out for law review anyway. <laughs> but he said, we want you to work for us throughout the school year, 20 hours a week. And um, we will pay you uh, the same salary uh, year round so that you and your husband can buy a house. The year-round monthly salary was $400 a month, but it was $400 a month. And in fact, we did buy a house that first fall. Um, but uh, I worked for the firm 20 hours a week all the way through law school. And I loved it. I'm, like I say, I'm not sure I would have even stayed in law school if I hadn't had that experience. Uh, it was wonderful. I learned a lot. Um, but what happened um, when we got when I graduated from law school in 76, um, Lionel Barrett had Charlie Ray as his associate doing criminal work. 
George Barrett had Jim Niffen as his associate doing labor work, and I was to be Bob Grant's associate doing civil litigation. Well, right as I started uh, practicing, uh, uh, Bob was appointed chancellor, and he went on the bench. And so I basically inherited his whole caseload. So between that Geyer case trial and inheriting Bob Brandt's caseload doing all kinds of things I had no business doing, I was just thrown in, sink or swim. Uh, but I had a lot of help, and uh, it was a pretty cool experience to be able to do all that stuff. Okay. And did you have a trial? I did. As, um, as in this part of your career? I did. I had a very early jury trial. Um, it was for a, a woman who was a caregiver for a Bellmead doctor's widow. Uh, and the allegation was that this uh, woman, this older woman, she was in her 90s, I believe, uh, had poked my client in the stomach with her cane uh, and caused her injury. Uh, and so I inherited that case and I tried my first jury trial that fall. Uh, it was in circuit court. Um, and uh, it was an amazing experience. The, uh, the woman actually had insurance for intentional torts. So they knew that there were a few problems going on here. So I was up against a very skilled insurance defense lawyer. And uh, as he was escorting this elderly lady with her cane to the witness box, as he was helping her up the stair into the witness box, she, right in front of the jury, almost poked him with her cane. <laughs> Needless to say, I won that case. Uh, and I believe the damages were like $8,655. I got $8,655 uh, as a jury verdict. And on my way back from the courthouse to my office, I stopped in at Dick Spate's office, who had been my trial ad professor at Vanderbilt and gave him full credit for my first jury trial win. Uh, but I was very excited and I, it was a lot of fun. Very exciting. And at this time, were you getting to know other young lawyers in Nashville? Uh, yes, I, I was. Um, and other uh, women lawyers, you know, we, we really gravitated toward each other. Um, uh, but I was, I was with George for uh, about, let me see, it was about a year and a half. Um, and I liked what I was doing. Um, but out of the blue, I got a call from Hal Harden, who had been named the new U.S. attorney by, uh, by President Carter. And um, he uh, asked me if I wanted to go into the U.S. attorney's office. And to me, working for the federal government as a kind of immigrant kid, kid of an immigrant anyway, uh, uh, to me, it would just be the pinnacle of anything I could ever do working for the federal government. And being an assistant U.S. attorney, I just thought this is unbelievable. So I took that job. Um, was uh, George Barrett happy about that? He was not happy. Um, <laughs> those of you who know George, you know, the federal government any government is the enemy, and I was going to work for the enemy. He was not amused at all. <laughs> uh, but anyway, I took that job, and at that time, there was kind of a woman's slot at the U.S. Attorney's Office, and there was one. There were eight of us in the office. Um, Sissy Daughtry had been the first. Martha Trammell had been the second. She was leaving, so I was to replace Martha, and Martha had done basically civil work. So that's basically what Hal presumed I would be doing was civil work. So that's what I did for a few months. And it became very clear to me that most of the civil cases settled and I really wanted to do trials. So I went to him and I told him that that looked like I wasn't going to get much trial work and really could I do some criminal work. And so he gave me the all the criminal cases in the Northeastern Division of the Middle District, which is Cookville. We had two FBI agents up in Cookville who were generating cases, and he said, you can do all the trials up in Cookville. And so I worked very closely with those two FBI agents. We had a lot of fun. We had a lot of cases. They were all tried in front of Judge Morton up in Cookville. 
And that's how I got started doing criminal work. Okay. And your career evolved from there. And what was your next step from well, the U.S. Attorney's Office? I was in the U.S. Attorney's Office here for about two years. And then my, uh, my husband at that time, um, UT Nashville, had been ordered by Judge Gray, merged with Tennessee State University. Uh, and he had been very supportive of the merger, uh, but he became disillusioned with the place after the merger. Uh, and so he took a job at Lake Forest College in Chicago. And I was lucky enough to be able to transfer into the U.S. Attorney's Office in Chicago. So I was um, in that office for a year. Um, they had separate criminal and civil divisions. I wanted to do criminal. So I was in the criminal division. Scott Tarot was down the hall for me. Uh, nice guy. He had written 1L and was working on Presumed Innocent that year. Um, and I just had a wonderful experience up there. Lots of training. Very, very much more sophisticated office, of course, than Nashville. I mean, we didn't even have prosecution memos in Nashville at that time. And Chicago had those. I brought that back with me. Uh, anyway, I was there for a year. And we decide, he decided he didn't want to stay at Lake Forest. And we really missed Nashville. So we came back. He had taken a lead so he could take his, get his job back. And I was able to come back into the U.S. Attorney's Office. So I was back here and in this office for another uh, two years. And who was the U.S. Attorney at this point? Um, Hal was still the U.S. Attorney. And then at some point, uh, Joe Brown, who was the first assistant, became the U.S. Attorney. And he made me the first assistant and chief of criminal when he became the U.S. Attorney. Okay. And at that point, um, were you still trying cases in Cookville? No, no, no. <laughs> no, I was not. Um, and it was uh, shortly after I got back from Chicago that I um, was asked to try the Blanton case with Bob Lynch. And tell um, us a little bit. I know that's a famous case to many people, but maybe there's some people who will be he hearing this who will want to know what, what, what that case was about. Like, who is Blanton? Okay. Uh, governor Blanton was a Democratic governor. Uh, of Tennessee, who actually made a lot of really good uh, judicial appointments, uh, including Bob Brandt, among others. But, um, uh, but he, uh, there were scandals in his administration. Uh, the biggest one that everybody knows about was the pardons and paroles scandal, where it was alleged that his administration was selling pardons and paroles for cash. Uh, and several people around him including his brother, were prosecuted uh, for that scandal. But Governor Blanton was indicted for um, selling liquor licenses to his friends. And that is the, uh, that is the prosecution that uh, Bob Lynch and I uh, participated in. Uh, it, was, uh, it was about a six-week trial. It was on the front page of the newspaper every day. It's when we had dedicated federal court reporters over here uh, all the time. Uh, it was a very big deal. Um, and who was uh, the judge? And the judge, well, we, all the judges in Nashville had recused themselves. Um, and in fact, Hal had recused himself from the investigation because he had been appointed a judge by Blanton. He had been a circuit judge appointed by Blanton. Um, but all the judges recused themselves. And so first we had uh, uh, Judge Peck from the Sixth Circuit, and then there were health issues uh, and after the selection of the jury, uh, he uh, came off the case and Bailey Brown, another Sixth Circuit judge from Memphis, who had been a district court judge, he was a great trial judge, he was appointed to try the case. Um, and uh, I had some interesting experiences with him. Tell us about those. Well, um, there were three defendants in that case, several lawyers. Uh, but I was the only woman lawyer that had any role. Uh, there was another lawyer from East Tennessee, but she really sat at council table and did not participate in the trial at all. And, uh, but I had 50% of this trial. And um, Judge Brown, uh, whenever he summoned all the lawyers to the bench or to his chambers, said, gentlemen. And I just let it pass for a long time. But a couple weeks into the trial, uh, it started 
eating away at me. I thought, you know what? He's got to see I'm not just carrying Bob Lynch's briefcase here. I am doing 50% of this trial, and this is getting to me. Um, so one time when we were leaving chambers, I decided I would hang back and say something to him. So I hung back. And um, I said to Judge Brown, I said, I don't, I don't know if you realize it, but every time you refer to all the lawyers, you call us gentlemen. And I paused and I presumed that he would just, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. I had no idea. You know, I'm an old fashioned Southern gentleman. I do, yeah, nothing. So I thought, well, maybe he needs a suggestion. So I said, you know, you could say counsel. Again, no response. So I slithered out of the office. Um, and the next time in the courtroom that he referred to all the lawyers, he called us gentlemen. And he continued to call us gentlemen uh, for several more days. And then at some point, he finally started calling us counsel. And that page of the transcript is in my memory book because it was a pretty big deal to me. Good deal. So maybe he continued that on other times. Hopefully. Hopefully. My, my theory was that he went back to Memphis and talked about it with his wife. And maybe she told him that he was wrong. <laughs> <laughs> and um, the Blanton case, as you've described, was a big case in terms of publicity and all that. What, um, what did that do for you, you think, in terms of your career or your standing in the profession? Or uh, it, it did immeasurable things for my career because... There was still a perception among many lawyers, male lawyers, and certainly clients of male lawyers that women were not tough enough to do litigation. Uh, and so it kind of smashed that myth. Uh, and I ended up, when I left the U.S. Attorney's Office, I ended up going with John Holland's firm. John Holland's had been another five-person firm, by the way. I love both my five-person firms, um, all men again. Uh, but John Hollins had been uh, an assistant district attorney. So he appreciated uh, what it was like to be a prosecutor. He knew that the trial skills of a prosecutor translate to civil work easily. You're a trial lawyer, you can do criminal, you can do civil. Uh, and so, and, and, being a former prosecutor, he appreciated uh, the importance of the Blanton case. And so he talked me up to all his clients. He introduced me to state farm representatives, insurance adjusters, all kinds of clients of his as the Blanton prosecutor, which gave me immediate credibility with them. Um, I can't, the way, I'm sorry. Yeah, By I'll the just, way, uh, just tell us what happened at the end of the Blanton case. Some of us know, but... For the record. Well, they what? were all convicted. <laughs> we did receive, yes, they were all convicted. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, um, it was quite an experience. Um, but So you were telling us about your job with John Holland. Yes. And so, so I just can't overestimate the value at that time as a woman of doing that case that was so visible to the community, to my career. I, I can't. Uh, overestimated. It was pretty remarkable. And I hope it helped other women that were trying to do litigation at that time. I think it did. I think it did. So at some point you went to the College of Charleston and you were in-house counsel essentially at the College of Charleston. Tell us about that. Well, once again, my academic husband <laughs> wanted to make a move and being old fashioned, I, you know, I followed my husband. Uh, to John Holland's dismay. He was very mad at me. Uh, but anyway, um, uh, so John took a job at the College of Charleston and uh, I interviewed with firms, but um, you could not, I could not reciprocate into South Carolina. It was very difficult to reciprocate into South Carolina and I could not do it. And so the job I ended up getting was I was the first in-house counsel at the College of Charleston. Um, and uh, it was uh, admi administrative work. I, you know, I redid their disciplinary code. Uh, we had a trial. We had um, discipline trials of students. We uh, fired a French teacher for per for um, plagiarism. I mean, there were lots of interesting issues. As the in-house counsel of the college, everybody 
thinks you're their lawyer. I mean, in fact, I worked for the president and the provost, but the faculty thought I was their lawyer. The students thought I was their lawyer. Everybody thinks you're their lawyer. It was a plethora of interesting issues. Uh, I had always done some education law, and this enriched that body of law for me so that I became, when I came back to Nashville, I was more of a specialist in education law, even because I'd had, I'd had that year. Uh, I didn't enjoy it that much. Uh, because, Is that because you weren't? Because I wasn't in the courtroom. And I was hiring lawyers to try the cases, and I wanted to be the lawyer trying the case. Um, so it was, you know, a little frustrating for me that way. Anyway, we decided once again to come back to Nashville. And so luckily, um, he was able to take his job back and, um, and I could have gone back to John Holland's, but by that time, Bob Lynch, who was a very close friend and, uh, was working for, um, Gilbert, uh, Her Gilbert and Milam, Her Gilbert and Milam. Yes. Gilbert Meaning Milam. Harris Gilbert? Gilbert, Frank, and Milam. Okay. I'll get it right. Gilbert, Frank, and Milam. Harris Gilbert, Dick Frank, and, um, and uh, Mike. Mike Milam, who had taught me copyright at Vanderbilt. And Bob said, look it, they've got all this entertainment work, and I'm doing their litigation. I'm representing all these big entertainers, and you can come and do it too, and we're going to have such a big time. So I just, I interviewed and I decided I would go there. And so it was very, it was a lot of fun. I, inter I, uh, I represented Hank Williams Jr. in two or three cases. I represented Brent, uh, Brenda Lee uh, and uh, Mike Milam was wonderful to be feeding us these cases. Uh, Harris was a wonderful mentor for me. I loved working with him as well. Um, and so I worked there um, and then they merged with uh, Wyatt Tarrant and Combs. And so we became a branch of Wyatt Tarrant and Combs. Um, and I did not like the big law firm stuff, um, but I was there as a partner for several years. So you were doing, again, litigation. Yes. With, you like being in the, in the courtroom. Yes. And that's often very stressful work but you found it also to be fun. Oh, yes. I, I, I guess it, I guess it's, yeah, I guess it's stressful. It's, it's taxing, you know, you have to work really hard. You have to do a lot of preparation. Um, uh, but I loved all that. And, and, uh, so I, I liked, I liked that work. So what was your next step? Well, then, um, um, out of the blue, um, uh, Somewhere in here, John Arthur and I got divorced. He went off to Harvard and and ended up taking a job in uh, in New York. And anyway, we got divorced. And at some point, Byron Trauger and I uh, got married. And um, he was Phil Bredesen's lawyer. He had worked in Bredesen's earliest campaigns when Phil ran for Congress was his first campaign. And Byron had worked for him there. And... Um, uh, and we had a ski group. We went skiing every year with them and, and they were really close friends. And one day, uh, Phil called me up out of the blue. He had been elected mayor and he called me up out of the blue and invited me to go to lunch and asked me if I would be his chief of staff. And, uh, and the reason he wanted me to be his chief of staff is because of my reputation as a tough prosecutor. And those of you who lived in Nashville at that time know that Phil became the mayor after Bill Boner, who had a very scandalized uh, administration. He was up on ethics charges before he left Congress. He left Congress, was elected our mayor, and there were lots of ethical issues during his reign as mayor. And Phil wanted me to be his chief of staff to show the world that, you know, this, we're going to do something different. And the first assignment as the chief of staff was to write an ethics code for Metro, uh, which my future colleague, Todd Campbell, helped me with. Um, but anyway, uh, Phil knew that at that time, Byron and I were trying to adopt a baby. And uh, I didn't know what I was going to do if we got a baby. 
Uh, but Phil knew that. And I said, well, I will come and I will stay as long as I can. If we get a baby, I'm gone. Uh, he said, that's fine. So I went over there. I did that for about a year. Um, and then we adopted a baby. And uh, uh, I stayed home for a year and a half with our baby. So the working in the mayor's office, how did you find that? Was that a satisfying Again, you were not in the courtroom, but was that a, a satisfying job offering different kinds of challenges? Very, very different challenges. The best part was that you were the Metro legal director selected by Phil. So we had a lot of fun doing that. But uh, it was a big challenge to me. And uh, I had no idea about the sort of political undertones of things. And I did the best I could, but once again, it was an administrative job, and, and I just, I don't like administrative jobs, which is why I'm glad that when it was my turn to be chief judge over here, I was too old, so I never had to be the chief judge, because <laughs> um, I don't like administrative work. So, I mean, I think I helped him a lot. I learned a lot from him, just watching him. He's an incredible leader, and he's so smart, and it was, and I know you had the same experience with him. It was just awesome to watch him perform in that role. And I learned a lot from him. Um, uh, but it, you know, it wasn't my cup of tea and, uh, I knew I wasn't there forever. So that was good. Um, so I stayed home for a year and a half. Uh, I loved it. Uh, I was still on leave from my firm. I could have gone back to Wyatt Tarrant after I left the mayor's office. Um, um, and I didn't know what I wanted to do or whether I would go back. There were very few, let me just say at this time, this was the uh, early 90s. There were very few women with children doing litigation. I mean, I could probably count them on one hand. Ann Davis was one. She was at Neil and Harwell. Uh, Carol McCoy. I mean, not, not yes, Carol McCoy, Jeannie Cass Stevens. There weren't very many doing litigation with children. Uh, and I wasn't sure that I could do that. Um, and out of the blue, Nashville got, the middle district got a new bankruptcy uh, judgeship. And Keith London was a close friend of mine, uh, bankruptcy judge. George Payne was a close friend of mine. They were both the bankruptcy judges. And they came to me and they said, you ought to come and try to get this job. And I said, how could I possibly do that? I wasn't a bankruptcy practitioner. I don't know anything about bankruptcy. Well, at that time, the Sixth Circuit uh, thought that the uh, bankruptcy system was too ingrown. There were, the fees were too high. Uh, you know, I won't object to your fee application if you don't object to mine. And they really wanted an outsider as the bankruptcy judge. So here I am. <laughs> so you considered yourself an outsider. I was very much an outsider. Uh, and anyway, I did get the job. Uh, and, and still had the reputation from the Blanton trial. Yeah, yeah. That, that has followed me through my career. Um, and so uh, I was a fish out of water over there, but I had two wonderful mentors uh, over there. Uh, and it was a good job to have with a little child. Uh, and uh, I did that for five years, but I never, I never really felt competent. I'm sure I did an okay job, but when the experienced people on the other side of the bar, like Bill Norton and Gail Reese and all those people knew, I knew, knew so much more than I did about the bankruptcy system. I just was never comfortable with that. So when Judge Nixon took senior status and there was a vacancy in the district court, I decided I need to, that, that, that's going home for me. That's where I have practiced. That's where I know what's up. And so that's when I decided I needed to try to get over there. Okay. Over you, you just said a minute ago that you got the bankruptcy judgeship. What exactly is that process? That process is, it's a selection of the Sixth Circuit. So you interview uh, with the Sixth Circuit. It's an eight-year appointment of the circuit court. Okay. Um, and the Sixth Circuit apparently still felt the same way uh, when they picked my successor, because they picked Marion Harrison, now the chief judge of the bankruptcy court, who likewise was not a bankruptcy practitioner. We're going to, uh, is it political, the appointment from the Sixth Circuit? Was it political? I don't think so. I don't, I mean, 
let me just say, I think the Sixth Circuit is a little more political now than it was in the early 90s. Um, I don't, I didn't see it as a political appointment at all. We're going to, you just talked about applying to become a district court judge, and we're going to talk about that a lot. But before we get back to that career, I just wanted to talk about a few other things during this, this um, time in your career and later. Um, other things you were interested in, other things you participated in. Let's talk about cooking. <laughs> cooking. Okay. Um, well, back in the um, mid 80s or so, um, a group of us uh, got together and formed what we call the, the Gourmet Dinner Club, the Dornay Gourmet Dinner Group. Uh, and it's lots of lawyers that you know and their spouses. And it was, it was four couples. Uh, and then when I moved to uh, Charleston, they replaced us uh, so that it was still eight. And, but then when we came back, they let us rejoin. So then it was 10. And so we have kept that up uh, through the years. Uh, we've been going since the mid 80s, early 80s, actually. And um, uh, every few months or so we get together. If it's at your house, you cook really gourmet things. We've all become much better cooks because we've uh, because we've learned to do a lot of things we didn't know how to do. And it's, it's, it's a lot of fun. Well, and you, at the beginning of this interview, you talked about your mother cooking every night, even though she was working outside the home. Do you follow that I tradition do. of practice? I cook dinner every night, and I look forward to that. It's a creative enterprise for me. I think I've had ahead of what I'm going to cook, and what have I got in the fridge that's going to go bad if I don't cook it tonight, and what will go with it? And um, Byron sits at the bar, and and he has his bourbon and Coke, and I have a glass of wine because I love to drink a glass of wine while I'm cooking, and we talk about our day, and, and I look forward to that um, every single every single day. And he loves my food, so it's very reinforcing. <laughs> and have you been traveling much? Do you like to travel? We love to travel, yes. We, we, uh, we've uh, traveled a lot and love to travel. We often travel with Byron's brother, and our sister-in-law from D.C., his brother's also a lawyer, and uh, we often travel with them. And uh, every summer, we usually spend a week at Polly's Island um, with, you know, all the families come. And well, let's talk about your family then a little bit. Okay. Um, you have a spouse you have um, mentioned. Yes. Whose name is? Byron what? Trauger, who is still practicing law. He, I was going to say, big, tell us what Byron does. Well, his big specialty is uh, getting certificates of need uh, for hospitals and uh, medical practices and that sort of thing before the administrative board that uh, that uh, legislates about that. And um, But he also um, spends probably half of his time uh, uh, doing nonprofit work he has been head of the uh, public television board, the public radio board. He has been president of the board of trustees of Martin Methodist College for probably, well, he's been president probably 10 years. He's been on the board probably 15 or 20. Um, he's uh, been head of the Public Education Foundation. Uh, he helped uh, start the Land Trust, the uh, Books from Birth. Uh, he's just, uh, he's a wonderful, uh, I just am in awe of him as a board member. He's such a better board member than I ever was in all the board work I ever did. Uh, but he, um, uh, he's very busy and he does a lot of, a lot of that. And, and I did, over the years, I did a lot of bar activities. Right, We're gonna, yeah, I wanna talk about that. Tell me about your children or child. Uh, we have one child, Catherine Trauger, who is 27 and uh, has given us, uh, as of nine weeks ago, uh, our third granddaughter. We have two granddaughters uh, that are seven and five, and now we have a little nine-week-old granddaughter. They all live next door to us, and so uh, we are very engaged and active uh, grandparents, and I'm called Yaya, which is the Greek name for grandmother. Uh, the Greek name for grandfather is Papu, which Byron has refused to be, so he makes them call him granddaddy. <coughs> Excuse me. So you're very involved in active grandmother. Very active grandparents, yes. And Byron uh, helps Riley with her 
piano lessons and yeah. Let's talk about singing. Singing. Well, um, I'm not a solo singer, but I've always been a, a group singer. I sang uh, in a trio with two other girls uh, in junior and senior high school. And then we all went off to different colleges. But when we were home for Christmas and at summer times, we would get together and sing at uh, nursing homes and events and things like that. Um, in college, I was in the choir uh, in college. And then for about the last 20 years, I've sung in the choir at our church. And I love show tunes and love to sing show tunes as I cook. <laughs> On, the wine and... <laughs> On the weekends. On the weekends. Drink wine and sing show tunes. It sounds good. Um, during your, your, a lot of your career, you have been precluded from doing political activity. Have you, in those times where it was allowed for you to do that, have you been involved or mainly on your own? Um, a little bit. Um, back when I was a teacher, um, I was quite involved. I, I met people like Mary Schaffner and uh, Jane Ann Woods and uh, uh, those early pioneer, Carlene Waller, the early pioneer women in politics in Nashville when I was still a teacher. Um, Larry Woods uh, did a kind of coup of the young Democrats, and I was part of that. Uh, I got to know him through that experience. Um, but then being an assistant U.S. attorney, you know, and of course working for George Barrett, for heaven's sake. You know, in fact, one of the first things George said to me was, um, and I think one reason he hired me was that my last name at that time was Arthur, and it was an A, and an A on a ballot is a big advantage. So um, I never did run for public office, but I know that's something he had in the back of his mind. Um, but then, you know, being an assistant U.S. attorney, you can't do that. Um, and uh, uh, But then Byron, of course, has been very, very politically active. And I suppose the most political thing I ever did is that when I was in the mayor's office, um, uh, the, 90, the 92 convention uh, came, or 91 convention, whichever it was, um, 92 convention. I was a delegate to the convention that elected, uh, that selected Clinton and Gore. And so I went to that convention and that was, that Democratic convention. It was in New York City. It was very, very exciting. I'm glad I got to have that experience. Okay. Oh. You do a lot of things. You, you cook, you sing, you have these uh, grandchildren you're very involved with. So do you ever have time to watch TV? Oh, yes. Oh, and yes. what do you watch? Well, um, a few years ago, when I decided I needed to start getting, we have a treadmill in our uh, in our bedroom. Uh, when I decided I needed to start getting on the treadmill more regularly, I thought I've got to find something that's going to get me on the treadmill because I have a television right in front of the treadmill. Um, I started watching Game of Thrones. So I'm a Game of Thrones person, as violent and sexy and everything else as it is. Um, but uh, Byron and I are big um, public television people. We watch Masterpiece Theater and The Mysteries and all that. We love all those programs. We're also, also both big Anglophiles because um, he lived in Oxford for three years. Um, I lived in England that one year I taught. And in college, I lived in England for a year. I spent a, a semester abroad in England. And so we're big Anglophiles. And so we love all those English programs. And we subscribe to Acorn and they have all the British mysteries and all that. So yes, we, we watch television and we love old movies. We both adore old movies, Hitchcock and all those. And over the years, you've been involved in bar association yes. uh, offices and just in the associations. Can you tell us a little about that? Yes. Um, uh, John Holland's uh, had been a president of the Nashville Bar Association, uh, and he really encouraged me to uh, to get involved in the Nashville Bar Association. Uh, and I, I had been involved even before then, but um, I was elected to the board uh, of the Nashville Bar Association. Unfortunately, 
uh, I was on the board less than a year when we moved to Charleston and I had to resign because I because we moved away. Uh, but then I did serve another year on the Nashville Bar Board. Um, but um, I was uh, one of the, as you were, a for, for, uh, one of the founding mothers of LAW and of T-Law. And I served as the second president of LAW and the second president of T-Law. Um, and you know, on the boards of those organizations and committee chair and was very active uh, in the 80s uh, uh, through uh, LAW uh, and T-Law trying to get more women on the bench. Could you just tell us what uh, LAW is and T-Law? LAW is the Lawyers Association for Women and T-Law is the Tennessee Lawyers Association for Women. Um, Sissy Daughtry, I'll never forget this. It was the year I was in the U.S. Attorney's Office in Chicago. And Sissy Daughtry called me up and she said, we're forming a women's bar association in Nashville. And I said, well, that sounds like a really good idea. Why are we doing that? And she said, well, you know, I've been a member of the National Association of Women Judges for a number of years. And she'd been on the bench at that point. She went on the bench in 75, I believe. So she'd been on the bench three or four years. And she went every year to the convention of the National Association of Women Judges. And there were tons of women judges in, from California. And she asked these women, how is it that you have so many women judges in California? And they said, well, the Women's Bar Association has gotten all these women on the bench. And she said, hmm, Women's Bar Association, that sounds like a good idea. So she, she decided we needed to have a Women's Bar Association in order to get more women on the bench. So um, that was her idea. She brought it to all of us. We uh, had great debates about whether it was going to be the Lawyers Association of Women or the Lawyers Association for Women. Were we going to let men be members? Um, and so we formed it. And then several years later, we, we went statewide. We, at that point, there was a Women's Bar Association in Knoxville and Memphis and Jackson. And, and we decided we needed to have an overall statewide organization as well. And the LAW in Nashville was the first one. Yes. Yes. The Marion and Griffin. It was not Marion Griffin for whom? Who was Marion Griffin? Marion Griffin, I believe, was the first woman to get a license in Tennessee. I should know that. You probably do. I forget. Okay. Anyway. Um so you've been involved in all these bar associations and why do you, do you think that's important and how do you think that's helpful to the community or to others? I think it's very important. I think LAW has served uh, an, 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 a crucial role in this community. Um, and in fact, it's really interesting. I was at a breakfast this morning for the past presidents of LAW. We have it every year as the new LAW president is coming in so she can tell us what her plans are and so we can give her our worldly wisdom. And one of the women there who has been very active in uh, she's been president of LAW, but she's also been very active in a lot of other bar associations. She said that LAW uh, is so rich in young women lawyers. The other bar associations are having trouble recruiting the young lawyers, but LAW is not. LAW is just rich with young lawyers because even though women have made such strides in the in the profession, there's a lot for them in LAW in the various programs that we have. Um, so I found that very interesting to, to hear this morning. But the first programs that we did for LAW were how to become a judge. How do you become a judge? How do you run for judge? And we got all these materials from those California judges. And that's what encouraged so many women to run for judgeships, not just try to get them through the political process through an appointment by a governor, but to run for judgeships. And without LAW and those programs, I don't, I think it would have been much longer coming, much longer. Coming. And LAW started to exert influence by writing to selection commissions or governors or whoever exactly. at different points. Is that right? Exactly. Yes. Okay. Um, okay. Do you want to take a break before you? Talk about okay. judge. I think a judge. Okay. Before the break, we were talking about how you decided to apply to be a 
district court judge here in Nashville. Tell us about that process. Okay. Well, um, uh, I uh, let, well, it was President Clinton and uh, Al Gore in the, in the White House. And um, I had known Al Gore uh, since he, we overlapped in law school for one or two semesters. Um, uh, Byron uh, and, and Byron's family had known the Gores uh, way before that. Uh, he's from Oak Ridge and his parents had known the Gores. Um, and Byron knew the Clintons uh, from Yale Law School and uh, Clinton and Byron had both been uh, Rhodes Scholars, so they had that connection. So we, we knew the president and the vice president. And uh, so I was sort of hoping, you know, I would just throw my name in there and, oh, of course. Uh, well, no, that was not what happened. Um, there were three other people interested. Gore actually was, uh, was intent on, on naming someone who, who was a state judge at that time who had been his first administrative assistant when he was in Congress. Um, and then there were two other people who were also interested, very stiff competition. And I realized that I was going to have to pull out all the stops and get every influential person I could think of to help me with this. Uh, and so I did that. And I was very lucky that one of the people who strongly supported me was Tom Sig was John Siegenthaler. And I was very lucky there. And was uh, there an application to fill out? Oh, yeah. Long, long application. Uh, and uh, uh, the uh, Charles Burson was Gore's, he was, had been the attorney general in Tennessee and he had gone off with Gore and was Gore's uh, either counsel or chief of staff or something, I think counsel. Um, anyway, so Burson was also very involved in the process. And um, so you fill out a long application. Then I had lots of people calling them and writing letters and so forth. And uh, I had an interview with Burson uh, in DC. And uh, anyway, got the call and was thrilled to death. And uh, so then of course you have the uh, confirmation hearing, which we're all familiar with. Uh, I had a Senate confirmation hearing. My confirmation hearing was during the Clinton impeachment. And there were about six of us uh, at the hearing. Uh, the only uh, substantive questions that I was asked were about uh, the death penalty and about capital habeas cases, because the person I was replacing, John Nixon, um, had delayed deciding capital habeas cases for many, many years to the extent that we had victims organizations uh, demonstrating in front of the federal courthouse. Um, and I never knew if it was because he was opposed to the death penalty or if it was just he didn't want to do those cases. They are mammoth. They are very time consuming. You're looking at lengthy state court records and, and I never knew why he didn't do them, but I could understand why he didn't. Uh, but the committee, that's the only thing they really asked me about uh, was could I make a decision that would result in someone being put to death. Uh, and luckily, because of my old-fashioned Greek father and him talking about guns in Rock Springs, Wyoming, and people getting killed, and I don't know, I, I said I could, and I thought I could. Uh, and it's good that I was able to because I had the first execution. I had the, the habeas for the first execution in Tennessee in 40 years after I'd been on the bench about two years. It was the co case. And the issue was whether he was competent to be executed. Um, I held that he was competent to be executed, and he was executed, and it was the first in 40 years. Um, I'm sorry, let's go back to just a minute. You said uh, you got the call about being a judge. Who called you? What a good question. I want to say it was Burson. I don't believe it was Clinton or Gore. I think it was Charles Burson. Okay. So your your you know many of the um, uh, hearings in the Senate are televised, but that may just be for the Supreme Court or or courts of appeals. So yours was yours televised? Or I you think, think it's on C-SPAN. I think they're on C-SPAN. I was very lucky because 
The two uh, Republican senators at that time were Fred Thompson, whom I had known for many years, and uh, Bill Frist, and they were both big fans of mine. So they both, they almost fought over who was going to introduce me to the committee. So I was very lucky that I had their support. And that's why I was able to get a hearing during the Clinton <laughs> impeachment. Okay. And did other people go to the hearing to speak on your behalf? Um, no. Okay. No. Okay. So you have now been appointed. And what happens then? And you had been a bankruptcy judge, so you're coming to the other side of the street and you're going to do trials. Thank goodness. Uh, and trials that most of the subject matter I'm familiar with uh, because I'd done it as a lawyer uh, practicing in firms or as an assistant U.S. attorney. Uh, and so what amazed me when I did it, started over here, uh, I didn't have this experience in the bankruptcy court because there really weren't trials in the bankruptcy court. But uh, what I experienced over here was that I got just as much of a kick out of being the judge for a trial as being a, a, a lawyer for a trial. Uh, I probably prepare for my trials as much as I did as a lawyer. I always have a chronology. I've read everything. And, um, uh, and so I have consistently gotten as much kick out of being the judge as being a lawyer, which was a big shock to me. Because I never, when I became a lawyer, I never had the goal of becoming a judge. I just stumbled into being a judge. I never had the goal of being a judge. I wasn't one of those people like Marietta who, you know, ran for office to be a judge. I didn't want to be a judge. I want to be a lawyer. So it was a surprise to me. Um, and the other thing that's made it enjoyable for me is, is um, I do all my own case management. And I have the lawyers around my conference table in my office. We don't have a court reporter there. Um, it's the first uh, uh, thing really that happens in the civil cases. And I get a real sense of the case. I get a sense of the lawyers, whether they're going to get along or whether it's going to be difficult. But I have all this informal uh, uh, contact with lawyers. And I love lawyers. And it's just a lot of fun. And I'm the only one now doing that. My other three colleagues are not doing their own case management. They have the magistrate judges do their case management. But I think it's what makes me continue to enjoy what I do. And how long now have you been on the bench? 20 years. 20 years on this bench. 20 years on the district court bench. Yeah. Go on. In December, it will be 21. And so are you planning to be on the bench for another 20 years? I'll probably be on the bench until I just heal over dead. I, you don't I have any retirement plans. I have no retirement plans. I mean, I could have taken senior status years ago, uh, in which case I get my same salary. I get to pick and choose the cases I want. <laughs> um, but I haven't taken senior status. Um, I haven't needed to. I, the only time I really felt I needed to is when we were down to two judges over here. Over the course of several months, we lost all our senior judges and we lost Todd Campbell to a disability retirement, Kevin Sharp to going back into private practice, and it was Waverly and me for over a year. Waverly. Waverly Crenshaw, now Chief Judge Crenshaw, who'd, who became the chief judge after one year on this bench. So it was newbie, Waverly Crenshaw, and me for over a year. We had over 800 cases apiece, uh, and we were drowning. Uh, we got a lot of help from uh, Detroit judges. Detroit has 15 active judges and seven senior judges. I don't know quite what they do up there, but a lot of them volunteered to come down here and help us. So that's how we survived. And it's but, sort of, I mean, has the caseload sort of, now been oh now evened. it's evened out. I feel like I'm on senior status now that we've gotten our fourth judge, Eli Richardson. We got him a few months ago, and I was able to give him a lot of cases. And so, um, yeah, I feel like I'm on senior status now. One reason I don't want to take senior status is that it's now mandated that you share courtrooms uh, as senior judges, uh, and I can't imagine managing a caseload without having full access to my courtroom. I think it's a wrong-headed policy decision on the part of the federal judiciary. So that's one reason I've never taken senior status. 
And have you um, enjoyed collegiality? Is there collegiality among the judges over here? We are so lucky. We have always had wonderful collegiality over here the whole time that I have been here. There, have, there were times before I came here where I know there wasn't as much collegiality. But we have always, since I've been here, been a very collegial bench. And we are even more collegial now. I mean, it's wonderful. I mean, we have two people that were appointed by Trump. And we have uh, two people appointed by Democrats. And, uh, and we couldn't be more collegial. We are, we, we, we value that highly. And I think it's kind of unusual when I go to judicial conferences and I hear stories. I, I think it's kind of unusual that we get along so well. We're really lucky. What would you say is the job of a judge? What's your job as the district court judge? My job is to look at the facts and the law and uh, do the best I can at deciding how a case should come out and making the tough calls when I have a lot of discretion where I could go either way. Do you have any clerks? I have two clerks. Uh, I hire very, very smart people, smarter than me. Uh, I uh, uh, never hire right out of law school. I always hire clerks that have been in private practice for at least two years, preferably more. Uh, I have one clerk that was in private practice. Uh, they're all in big law and they're, and they are, uh, uh, so they know what it's like to practice law and they know what it's like to be in a big law firm and what big law firms do, as well as little law firms. Uh, anyway, I had one fellow who'd been in private practice six years and he stayed with me four years uh, and he was invaluable. Uh, and uh, so I, I always hire experienced people as my law clerks. And, and I feel a little guilty about it because uh, a lot of judges feel that one of their main jobs is to mentor you know, people coming right out of law school. And, and I feel kind of bad that's, that that is not a value of mine. But I have always felt that um, this is a tough job. I want to do it as well as I possibly can. And so for me, what works is to hire really experienced people who are very, very valuable to me. When you... Uh, do people know who you are besides the lawyers who practice in your court? When you're out and about, do like non-lawyers and just regular people at the supermarket or anything know who you are? Not for the most part. Mm -mm. So do you have you ever had any real security concerns? No, I really, I really never have. Um, when I have been working on death penalty cases sometimes, especially the Cole case was, was pretty high profile, and the marshals felt it important that they walk me to my car every day, uh, but they didn't patrol my house or anything. And uh, I've, I've never, never been that concerned. When um, we've talked about how you prepare for cases and you like to do trials and you do your own case management, you're obviously busy as a judge and you're involved with bar things and you sing in the choir and all the other activities you have and your grandchildren next door. So how do you fit all that in? How do you do all that? Well, I am blessed with um, the energy that my mother had. As I told you, he she worked as a legal secretary into her 80s where she was two or three days a week commuting by bus from Denver to Boulder to work for one of her old bosses. Uh, <laughs> Uh, and she had boundless energy, and I think that I inherited that, and I feel really, really lucky. Let me ask you, how would you like to be remembered as a judge? That I was fair, that I uh, did not make decisions based on politics, which I think at this point in time is really, really important for us to be perceived that way, um, that I worked hard, that I listened, uh, that I treated the lawyers and the litigants well. Uh, 
If that were my reputation, I'd feel real good about it. And how would you like to be remembered as a lawyer? That I was a really good lawyer. (laughs) (laughs) That I knew my case, that I prepared, that I was a really good trial lawyer. I'd like to be remembered as a really good trial lawyer. And how would you like to be remembered as a, in your personal life, as a wife, mother, grandmother? Well, as a a really good wife, mother, grandmother, I guess. Doing. And how long have you and Byron been married? We will be married um, in two weeks. We will have been married 30 years. A long time. Yeah, it's good. Um, is there anything else that you wish I had asked you during this interview that you'd like to talk about? Oh, gosh. I don't think so. You've really covered the, the uh, waterfront, I think. Um, it's been really fun, and I'm glad that it's been you interviewing me because oh, you know you. me well, and you're a very skilled interviewer. And Oh, well, that was very sweet. Thank you. You've encouraged me with your smile. <laughs> thank you.